Kuklinski, we're going to conduct a bat search here. Put your arms out. On May 25, 1988, Richard Kuklinski was convicted of multiple murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. This ended 30 years of cold-blooded killing by a master criminal police called the Iceman. Richard Kuklinski is one of the most dangerous criminals we have ever come across in this state. He murdered by guns. He murdered by strangulation. He murdered by putting poison on victims' food. He did all of this at the same time while exhibiting a normal, placid family existence. His wife, his children uh, were uninvolved in his criminal activities. Yet, uh, we are faced with uh, evidence, convicting evidence of uh, numerous grisly murders. guess. Approximately we'll go with more than a hundred. How do you feel about killing? I don't. It doesn't bother me. Doesn't bother me at all. I don't have a feeling one way or the other. I think if I had a choice, I wouldn't. The following program is based on 17 hours of an interview conducted under maximum security at Trenton State Prison. Law enforcement officials allowed our cameras unprecedented access in an attempt to uncover details of various unsolved crimes. It was also hoped that the interview would help to penetrate the mind of Richard Kuklinski, a mind made for murder. Richard, when you were on the streets, what kind of weapons did you use? When I was out on the street to do something, I carried three guns and a knife. I had a derringer in each pocket. And a gun on my ankle, a bigger per gun just in case. And a knife. And it all depends how it came about. You indicated yesterday that he used a shotgun rather than a stop light or something like that. Or... I had a red light. We were following this fellow. I pulled up with a, a red light, came alongside of him, <clears throat> and shot the shotgun and took his head off. He never saw the green light. It was a sort of shotgun. It was very, uh, as a matter of fact, when it happened, it surprised me. I expected the, uh, the man to uh, die, but I, it really surprised me when it, it, when it took his head off. It was uh, something I didn't expect. Richard Kuklinski is not a serial killer. He's not a drug-crazed uh, wild man running around with a machine gun. He's not a person that is driven by perverse uh, sexual desires. He doesn't drink. He doesn't gamble. Uh, all of these things, um, which many persons that are involved in killing and murders uh, often are motivated by. Richard Kuklinski, instead, uh, is nothing more than a predator uh, on human beings. Uh, his motivation is greed, and his method of murder is very varied. Uh, and very extreme. Richard, I understand that you're an expert at the use of cyanide. How many times did you kill with it? Quite a few. What's the different ways you use cyanide? 
you could uh, put it in liquid form. You could, uh, there could, person could say, for instance, a person could be in a bar. You bunk into them, possibly uh, by mistake, or say you were intoxicated, spill a drink on them, and leave. Everybody just looks around, thinks you were drunk, or that you just had an accident or something. And uh, meanwhile, it's soaking through their clothes into their pores and into their system. And eventually, they'll die. I've been in a restaurant where we were eating, and the guy went to the bathroom. And uh, uh, when I was in the bathroom, we put a little boost in his, uh, in his food. And um, he was rushed to the hospital after that. And uh, he died. And they buried him. I'm not exactly sure what they put on, what they attributed his death to. But, you know. It wasn't homicide. Somewhere, and I don't know where, he picked up on cyanide poisoning as being a good way, a good, quick way to kill somebody. It's such a good way to kill somebody that that's the gas that's used in gas chambers. I mean, it, cyanide in a gas vet form, which is similar to cyanide in a, in a, in a being eaten form, kills very quickly. It's a very, it kills faster than arsenic, faster than strychnine, and it's hard to detect um, if the person, if it isn't specifically looked for. He murdered, sometimes months apart, years apart. He used different methods. Um, he would go so far as to uh, plan in his crimes uh, the actual deceit of law enforcement. Uh, by that I mean he would on occasion uh, murder someone, uh, cut their body, wrap them in layer after layer of plastic bags and material, and then deposit the body many, many miles from the murder scene. What is it to dispose of something? You throw it away. You throw it anywhere. It all depends if you don't want it found or if you want it found. If you want it found, it doesn't matter. You just leave it there. If you don't want it found, you could take it somewhere. You could bury it. You could uh, put it in a big drum. You could put it in the trunk of a car and have it crushed. You leave it in town, you could put it on a park bench. I mean, you know, you could put it anywhere you want. They found a few people sitting on park benches, I'm sure. As a matter of fact, I know they have. Are there any murders that you committed that, you, that haunt you, that you just sort of, you feel and you do? Nothing haunts me. No murders haunt me. Nothing. I don't think about it. That's why it's hard for me to tell you. In order for me to be able to tell you when something happened, I'd have to think about why, when. If I think about it, it would wind up hurting me. So I don't, I don't think about it. If I had a choice, and of course, you as already said to me, we all have choices. <laughs> Maybe we do. At the time, I didn't seem to have one. But if I could have, I would like to be different than what I am. I would have liked to have been different than what I was, yes. It would be better. It would have been better for me. I would have liked to have had a better outlook on life. but I can't change yesterday. 
Richard Kuklinski was born April 11, 1935, in a low-income public housing project in Jersey City. His father was a brakeman for the railroad, and his mother worked in a meatpacking plant. I didn't like my father, because he would beat me just because uh, he felt like to get my attention, I guess. He would think nothing of coming in and smacking you, you know, basically. He'd just come in and give you a whooping for another reason whatsoever. And my mother was cancer. She would destroy everybody. She thought I took too long to do something. She didn't hesitate to give me a swat here and there. And she didn't just use her hand. She, she would hit me with a, a broomstick or something like that. It wouldn't, it hurt. As a matter of fact, she broke the broom on me more than once. Richard's mother believed that harsh discipline at home should go hand in hand with a rigid religious education. I was raised uh, Catholic. Uh, we were very, she was strict as far as the religion goes. I went to... Uh, Your mother. My mother, yeah. My mother, uh, we went to uh, Catholic grammar school. And we were raised with the Catholic belief. I was even an altar boy. But uh, during the course of my life, I don't really believe it. It's just the way it happened. Didn't mean it to happen that way, but it just happened that way. When his father abandoned the family, Richard, a skinny, timid young teenager, was left to fend for himself. He was an easy target for street gangs, but by the time he was 16, things began to change. When I was a young man, I found out that if you hurt somebody, they'll leave you alone. Good guys do finish last. When I tried to leave everybody alone, just do my own thing, everybody just wanted to hurt me. Until one day, I just decided, well, I've had enough of this picking. And I went upstairs, and I took a, uh, a bar, which the clothes used to hang on in the uh, closet. And I went back downstairs, and there were like six young men still figuring they were going to mess with my head. And uh, we went to war. To their surprise, I was no longer taking the beating. I was giving it. And that's when I learned that it was better to give than to receive. I've been known to hurt people for no reason. If you check out my background as I came up, I could be anywhere and if somebody humiliated me, I would think nothing of hitting them with a cue stick. In an instant, And the only thing they might have done was made me feel bad or challenge my authority at the time. Kuklinski's reputation as a tough guy with a hair trigger temper grew. By the time he was 18, the abused had become the abuser. It wasn't long before he committed his first murder. I got into a fight in a bar. We got into an argument, a fight, and I hit him with a, with a cue stick. Uh, a few too many times, and he died. How'd you feel after, uh, when you found out he had died? I had felt very bad, very, very bad. I was upset. I didn't mean to do it, actually. But surprisingly, I felt sadness, and after a while, I felt something else. 
I didn't feel sad. I was sad along with some sort of a rush that I had control. And if you mess with me, I guess it's, if you mess with me, I'll, I'll hurt you. By the time he'd reached his 20s, Kuklinski had become a petty crook and pool hustler. Then his life changed. In 1960, he met a pretty 19-year-old girl named Barbara Pedrin. He was absolutely flowers at the door every day and, and uh, considerate and romantic and all of the things that anybody could, could hope for, dream for. He bought me beautiful things. We went fun places. He, he was happiest when we were together. He was happiest when just he and I were together. He and Barbara had three children. But with just an eighth grade education, he could only get low paying jobs that didn't pay enough to support his growing family. I didn't have the capability of getting a better paying job. Was I gonna push a yarn truck the rest of my life? Make menial amount of money? I couldn't have afforded one child, let alone three. He went to work at a film lab, where he began to pirate pornographic films and sell them to outside sources connected to the Gambino crime family. This connection led to other criminal activities, and it wasn't long before he went from being a small-time hood to a big-time killer. He worked as a hitman and associated with a gang that worked out of the notorious Gemini Lounge in Brooklyn. Above the lounge was a mafia killing factory where victims were killed and dismembered. Hacked bodies were packaged in plastic bags and carted away. Kuklinski was the perfect enforcer. He was brutal and he knew how to intimidate. If people owed money, they either paid up or paid with their lives. Most people paid their bills. Some didn't. I remember one guy, he was um, owed a lot of money. Well, I guess a considerable amount of money. Uh, he hid behind, he thought he could hide behind a door. It was a nice door, expensive door. Anyway, uh, most people don't realize that uh, when you come to answer a door, uh, if there's light in the background, the person on the outside can look through the peephole and see the guy coming to the door. So he came to the door, I asked who it was, and uh, he looked through the peephole. And he never saw what hit him. For Richard Kuklinski, murder had become a way of life, and the macabre became the commonplace. Would you ever use a chainsaw? I mean, to cut someone up? Yes. I've done that. To dismember them, yes. Not to kill them, no. Well, what was it like to cut somebody up with a, with a uh, you know, even though the guy was dead? How did it feel to cut some guy up with a, with a chainsaw? Well, I didn't have any feeling one way or the other. That that just happened. That's the way it had to be. Messy. Yes. Yes, it was. Did it make you sick? No. I've had a request where the guy wanted the guy's tongue cut out. And he also wanted his tongue put in his uh, rear end. So I believe there was a definite point he wanted to get across. I have an experience that I don't know if I should tell you or not. 
that it might, it probably would offend a lot of people. Uh, I don't know, I don't think I should, I'll go into that. Go ahead. Nah, it's not a good one. No, go ahead, tell him. There was a man, he was begging and pleading and, uh, and, and praying, I guess. And um, he was pleased God and all over the place. So I told him he could have a half hour to pray to God. And if God could come down and change the circumstances, He'd have that time. But God never showed up. And he never changed the circumstances. And that was that. It wasn't too nice. That's one thing I shouldn't have done, that one. I shouldn't have done it that way. By the 1970s, between his illegal activities and contract killings, he was becoming a wealthy man. He now lived in an expensive home in a middle-class neighborhood with his wife and three children. Richard, what did you charge for a, for a hit? If I hit somebody, I wouldn't hit it for peanuts. I'd, I'd like to have some, some money. I say if I were to do somebody, I want at least five figures. And at least up in the better half, not the lower half of the five figures. Kuklinski kept his criminal life secret from his family and neighbors. He told them he was a businessman. No one knew his business was murder. We were perfect. My children were never in trouble. We were perfect. We were the all-American family. I mean, we had what seemed to be the perfect life. There were wonderful times. And time with his family was the only thing that he was really concerned about. I mean, if he never had to leave the house, he would have loved it. He hated to have to travel. He hated to go away. He came back as soon as he can. He wanted to be home all the time. He wanted to be with us all the time. I enjoyed that way of life. I felt I had achieved something. I very seldom left the house unless I had to, because I felt secure in the house. I felt very secure. I tried to provide the best for them, as I knew how. Might not have been the right way to go, but it was, for me, the only way. I tried to never let anything touch the house. I brought nobody there. My family was not exposed to anybody. I wanted to show them the good side of life, not the bad side. Richard had a very, very sad childhood. You got the impression, or I knew because he would like say something and then drop it and change the subject, that he was abused and that there was no love. He, he grew up absolutely without any love, without a doubt. I mean, the first Christmas, uh, with my family, he, he couldn't, he was in awe. He couldn't believe it. It was a tree and, and everyone was cooking special things and there was lots that we were laughing and it was fun and he kept saying, I, I can't believe that this is what happens. It was a Jekyll and Hyde existence. 
the way it was and the way I wanted it to be with absolutely two different, two different lives. I wanted one life. I had to have another life. This other life would interrupt one Christmas Eve. While his family was celebrating the holidays, Kuklinski left his home to collect on a bad debt. Business was business, even on Christmas Eve. The man owed me money. He was giving me a runaround. I told him I wasn't happy that he wasn't going to pay me. He had the attitude that uh, nobody could hurt him. I think he was wrong. Only way he never saw Christmas. What did you use? Uh... A gun. Extremely loud inside of a car. <laughs> Matter of fact, my ears were ringing for a long time. What'd you do afterwards? I walked away, got in my car, and went home. What'd you do when you got home? I put toys together for the kids for Christmas. I saw the broadcast while I was putting the toys together that came down. Mob-related killing. That was the first time I knew I was mob-related. <laughs> How'd you feel? I was annoyed I couldn't get the damn wagon together. I never questioned him. And you just knew, don't do it, don't ask. Uh, if he got up at 2 o'clock in the morning or during dinner and put on his shoes and walked out the door, you said, bye. You didn't say, where are you going or why are you going? And it was just understood that that's the way it was. He was very private. You only knew what he wanted you to know. By the 1980s, after 25 years of working as a hitman for the mob, Richard Kuklinski became the head of his own crime ring. He developed new ways to profit from murder. The case of Paul Hoffman was typical of the way he operated. On the afternoon of April 29, 1982, Hoffman arrived at a warehouse leased by Kuklinski. Like numerous victims of the Iceman, he had been set up for a phony business deal. Paul Hoffman was a pharmacist, and he was looking for a quick buck. Uh, he was out to purchase a drug called Tagament, which was at the time a wonder drug for ulcers. And he felt that if he could purchase a large quantity of this Tagament at a, uh, at, at a very low price, that he could, he could indeed make a, a, a huge profit on that. And that was the alleged deal that he had with Richard Kuklinski. When Paul Hoffman showed up to buy the tagament, he was carrying $25,000 in cash. He took the bag, door opened it, showed me a whole mess of money, a whole mess of cash. He said, look, I got the money right here. And he came back. He says, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, how am I going to get this merchandise? I put the gun under his chin, and I said, there is no merchandise. And I shot him. He didn't die. The gun jammed. He was gurgling. I had hit him. It was, uh, blood was pouring out of his mouth. And, uh, I 
He was in a, I would imagine a lot, it looked like he was in a lot of pain. So there was a tire iron in there. I took the tire iron and hit him with it, which knocked him out. And uh, he died. I then took him and put him in a 50 gallon drum, put it on the side of a, of a motel. It was behind Harry's corner. I listened to the people. I went in Harry's every morning. The thing was there for a long time. I looked at it every day. It was there. I went in Harry's every day. One day it was just missing. Continued to go in Harry's to see if anything was said about it. Nothing was said. I don't know what happened to the drum. By the 1980s, Kuklinski was involved in narcotics, pornography, arms dealing, money laundering, hijacking, and contract killing on a worldwide basis. He was also pressing 50 and getting tired. He started to make mistakes. He began to leave traces, and law enforcement officers who had suspected him over the years began gathering evidence. Kuklinski would protect himself by killing anyone who could testify against him. On December 27, 1982, a body was discovered at the York Motel in New Jersey. The body was identified as Gary Smith, 37. Smith had been given cyanide and then strangled to death. This was the first of many mistakes Kuklinski was to commit. Gary Smith was found under a motel bed in New Jersey, as I recall, where some 20 people had used the room in five days and nobody had realized there was a rotting body underneath it. The body was found in a decomposed state. It was very hot weather. Smith would have not been identified as a murder victim if he had died only of the cyanide. If the cyanide had worked and he had died and he didn't need to be strangled, that ligature mark around the neck wouldn't have been seen and he would have been possibly a, her a drug addict overdose or lots of other things of, an in of a non-homicidal nature would have to be considered. On September 25th, 1983, the body of Louis Mazgay was found. As he had done many times before to confuse the time of death, Kuklinski had frozen the body in an industrial freezer. This was the murder that earned him the name of Iceman. This murder was also his second deadly mistake. He did too good a job in that body because he left that body in the freezer for two years, then took the body out and dumped it in Rockland County and the body was found before it had fully thawed out. So the doctor doing the autopsy, the medical examiner in Rockland County, when he opened the body up, saw ice inside the body in the summer's day and said, there's something wrong here. This guy uh, could not have died two days ago the way he looks like from the outside. On May 14th, 1983, a bicyclist was riding down a lonely road in a wooded area and saw a buzzard feeding on a body. It was Daniel Deppner, 44, the third business associate of Richard Kuklinski, to be found dead. The body count grew. There would soon be five unsolved murders with one thing in common. The last person to see the victims alive had been Richard Kuklinski. After 30 years of getting away with murder, Richard Kuklinski's time was running out. He had been under investigation for three years and the police were beginning to put the pieces together. What I told uh, m my superiors uh, in Trenton was that, hey, look, you know, we can check with the FBI and, and, and we can see that there's <clears throat> a certain number of given uh, serial killers roaming around this country of ours. But take a good hard look at what we got here. We got Richie Kuklinski. And there's only one of him. In 1986, a division of the New Jersey Criminal Justice Department set up a task force made up of federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. 
The task force analyzed existing investigative material and gathered new information. They had one mission, to arrest and convict Richard Kuklinski. When I first read the file, which at the time was nothing more than a compilation of, uh, of several different unsolved homicides, the more you looked for connections, the less you found in this particular case, because there was different types of murders, different devices used. The final method that was used was, in fact, the introduction of a uh, undercover federal agent, Dominic Polifron, uh, who was able to win Mr. Kuklinski's confidence and was able to record conversations where he detailed his participation in these murders. I portrayed myself as a hitman. I told him I worked for the uh, wise guys downtown New York, and my, my brother was a good fella downtown, and uh, I went by the name of Dominic Michael Provenzano. You willing to uh, go out on a, on, a, on a contract? If the price is right, I'll talk to anybody. Yeah? Sure. And you mean to tell me your way is nice and clean and nothing fucking shows up? Well, it may show, my friend, but it's quiet. It's not messy. It's not noisy. It's not, uh, you know. Yeah, but how the fuck do you put it together like? You know what I'm saying? Oh, well, there's always a way. There's a will. There's a way, my friend. We used to sit down. We'd talk. Either we'd go to those tables over there and get away from people, and we'd discuss how to murder people. I just have a few problems I want to dispose of. I have some rats I want to get rid of. Yeah. The only fucking thing I don't understand. Don't you use a fucking piece of iron to get rid of these fucking people? Use this fucking uh, sign? Why be messy? You can do it nice and calm. It became apparent uh, at later points in the investigation that Mr. Kuklinski uh, fully intended on murdering Dominic Polifron in addition to um, the victims that were being discussed at the time they were having these tape-recorded conversations. So he could pretty much tell Dominic Polifron anything because he knew shortly that uh, he had plans for Mr. Polifron too. You put that stuff in a mist, you spray it in somebody's face, and they go to sleep. No shit. As long as he's dead, that's the bottom line. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? No matter how it was done, I mean, I know guys that went to sleep and never woke up again. I mean, you know. <laughs> he says he had one guy he went and get a hamburger, they come back, and he put the cyanide on his hamburger. And we're sitting down, and he's telling me, he says, you wouldn't believe it. He says, I'm waiting for this guy to keel over. He says, because once you eat cyanide, usually it would, you'd roll over, and, and that's it. He says, this guy had the constitution of a fucking bull. He says, you wouldn't believe it. He says, he wouldn't die. And we're both laughing about this. And I'm saying in the back of my mind, I said, holy God. I said, look at this. I said, what kind of person is this? I said. I said to myself right there, I said, you better cover your butt. I said, because you just don't know with this guy. And he'd be kidding about it, and I'd be laughing. In the back of my mind, I'm saying, this is the devil. No question about it, this is the devil. On December 17th, 1986, the special task force set up a roadblock and arrested Richard Kuklinski outside his home in Dumont, New Jersey. They felt they had all the evidence they needed for a conviction. The whole road was blocked off with cops. Uh, local police, state police, Division of Criminal Justice investigators, county personnel. There was no place for him to go, so he stopped his car. He was told to get out of the car, and he did not. So he was uh, taken out of the car, and he was placed face down on a street in a position where we thought we were safe. And then I handcuffed him. That guy's big. I did everything I could to get one click on the handcuffs. And uh, later on, uh, I tried to put leg irons on them, and there's no, no way they would go on. They just wouldn't go on. Law enforcement authorities have arrested one of the most notorious contract killers in state history. A self-employed Bergen County man is behind bars, charged with five murders, and prosecutors are investigating his involvement in dozens more. This is unwarranted. 
Unnecessary. These guys watch too many movies. He is such a cold-blooded killer, they call him the Iceman. After being convicted of two murders, he confessed to two others in court today. I shot George Malvin five times. Uh, Louis Masgay on July 1st, 1981. I uh, shot him once in the back of the head. When the judge asked him why he had killed the two men, Kuklinski replied. It was due to business. Dominic Polifron's tapes had nailed Kuklinski, but in court, the Iceman greeted the undercover cop with a smile. He seemed to be quite cheery about saying hello to you. Well, I reciprocated. The only thing is, uh, I'm going home, and uh, he's going to a different environment at the present time. It wasn't real to us. We just had a hard time dealing with what was in the press. And I kept saying, no way, and I don't believe it. And then when I actually heard his voice you know, in court, it was very hard to believe that he talked like that. It was very, very difficult to believe. I've done it always. As far as you've known or heard, there isn't too many things I haven't tried. No matter how it was done, I mean, I know guys that went to sleep and never woke up again, I mean, you know. <laughs> The consensus of the federal, state, county, and local law enforcement agencies that were involved in this investigation uh, is that Richard Kuklinski is one of the most dangerous criminals we have ever come across in this state. Uh, further, it's our feeling that uh, he is of such a diabolical, methodical type of killer that it's very possible that when all is said and done, we still may never know how many people he has actually killed. What Richard has been accused of and found guilty of and spoke to you about goes against God and man. I have very strong feelings. I am totally anti-violence, I mean, as are my children. And um, I can't make those wrongs right. I can't make them right in my own mind. We are Richard Kuklinski's family, and we aren't ourselves anymore. We're, we're Richard Kuklinski's family. I've never felt sorry for anything I've done other than hurting my family. Only thing I feel sorry for I'm not looking for forgiveness and I'm not repenting. No, I am wrong. I'm wrong. I do want my family to forgive me. Oh, boy. I can make this one. Oh, shit. This would never be me. This would not be me. I feel for my family. You see the Iceman cry. Not very macho. I've heard people that mean everything to me. But the only people that mean anything to me.
I would move heaven, hell, and anything in between to get to you. You wouldn't be safe anywhere if I was mad at you. And that's not bull, Dip. That's truth. I've went up against people. You could pull a gun on me, and if I'm mad at you, I'm coming forward. You'd have to shoot me to stop me. And if you don't kill me, you're stupid. Because the next time you see me, <laughs> I will kill you. In 1991, Richard Kuklinski, a contract killer known as the Iceman, was interviewed by HBO for an America Undercover special. How many people have you killed? I'm an approximate guess. Approximate will go. More than a hundred. After a lifetime of killing for hire, Kuklinski was finally caught by an undercover ATF agent wearing a hidden wire. You willing to uh, go on a, on, a, on a contract? If the price is right, I don't talk to anybody. Yeah, but how the fuck do you put it together? Like, you know what I'm saying? Well, there's always a way, there's a will, there's a way, my friend. Richard Kuklinski is one of the most dangerous criminals we have ever come across in this state. He murdered by guns. He murdered by strangulation. He murdered by putting poison on victims' food. He did all of this at the same time while exhibiting a normal, placid family existence. His wife, his children uh, were uninvolved in his criminal activities. Yet, we are faced with uh, evidence, convicting evidence, of uh, numerous grisly murders. In 1986, the ATF and the New Jersey Organized Crime Task Force set up a roadblock outside Kuklinski's home. It took five men to bring down the six-foot-five, 300-pound killer and force handcuffs on him. The Iceman's career as a master criminal was finally over. Richard Kuklinski knows he will never get out of jail. With nothing left to lose, Kuklinski reveals new secrets about the years he spent as a contract killer for the Gambino crime family, and tells what happened in his life that turned him into a man law enforcement called the Iceman. I hated my father. If I could have, I probably would have killed him. Probably would have felt good about it, too. My father would beat me just for this, just if I looked at him. He gave me this impersonal feeling I have to when people die in front of me, especially loudmouth people. Loudmouth people remind me of my father. Once a loud mouth person starts with me, I love it. That's the only excuse I need. One night in a bar, a loud mouth made the mistake of insulting the 18-year-old Kuklinski in front of people. A couple of hours later, the Iceman saw his chance to get even. I come out of this bar and I see him sleeping in his car. I got you, little sucker. Now I got you. I'm gonna give you. A, I'm gonna light your fire, <laughs> and I did. I got myself a bottle, some gasoline, and I threw it in the car with him. And he was screaming and yelling and burning, and the car burned. I could smell him. I walked down the block and I could hear him as I turned the corner. He was still yelling.
This was a personal thing, yeah. See, this was a guy I disliked. What did he do to you? He made me mad. By the age of 25, Richard Kuklinski had no problem with murder. But now he wanted to get paid for it. There was money in contract killing. To prove himself, he auditioned for Mafia Capo Roy DeMeo. He said, well, I would expect you to, uh, if you came with me, I'd expect you to, uh, if I told you to whack somebody, you'd whack him without any question. So I said, well, I could probably do that. He says, uh, you probably could do it or could you do it? Did you, do you think you could do it? And I said, yeah, I think I could do it. So he told Freddie to get the car, got the car. He and I got in the back seat, Freddie was driving. We drove someplace, I'm, I don't know where it was, it was someplace in New York. And we were sitting there for a while, we got to where we were going, we were sitting there for a while, and a man came in the distance, he was walking his dog, it looked like. So he said, all right, take this guy down. I said, which, what? Which guy are we talking about here? So he says, the man walking the dog. So I got out of the car and I started walking towards the man. And the man was walking his dog just like a regular guy. As he passed me, I turned around and shot him. Freddie and Roy pulled up in the car, I got in the car, and we drove away. And that is how I got involved with Roy, with doing things like that. Roy DeMeo's hangout was the Gemini Lounge in Brooklyn, New York. It was a house of horrors, where over a hundred people were murdered, chopped up, and disposed of by DeMeo and his gang of lethal contract killers. After proving himself, Kuklinski quickly became one of DeMeo's favorite enforcers. DeMeo ordered the hits, and Kuklinski executed them without question. He wanted this guy uh, taken care of. Uh, but he wanted to talk to him first. So uh, when I got to the place, I asked the man for the money, so the guy says he didn't have it and Roy would just have to wait until he got the money to pay him. And that was that, he'd have to wait. I, so I said to the man, I said, well, you, you have to then talk to him. He wants to talk to you. So I dialed the phone mm -hmm. number and uh, he got on the phone and I said, he wants to talk to you. So he was talking to him and uh, I guess they were acting like everything was all right because he got off the phone and he handed me the phone back. He says, hey, I told you he'd wait. He's in the frame of mind, don't worry about it. He wants to talk to you now. So I picked up the phone and he said, kill him. So I shot him. Hung up the phone and walked away. I'm just a hardworking expediter of sorts. I looked at myself as a person who did something that somebody wanted done, and they paid me a good price. In the early 80s, the Gambinos were feeling the heat of an intense investigation, which reached as high as their boss, Paul Castellano. 
As the pressure from law enforcement grew, the family began to worry about potential witnesses. One in particular presented a major problem. His name was Peter Calabro. The family ordered a hit, and Kuklinski was given the contract. On March 14, 1980, Kuklinski drove for hours on a snow-covered road in Saddle River, New Jersey, waiting for a call to come through on his walkie-talkie. I get a call that they're on their way. So now they're coming. And it's snowing. The roads are very bad. A lot of snow slipping and sliding. And I was in a van. So what I figured is, at the last moment, I had a, a different plan with it. At the last moment, I decided, well, I'm going to double park this thing. This will give me the edge because this will make him have only one way to come by, and that's he has to come right by this van. And I go to the back of the van, and I go out the back door. I take the shotgun with me, of course. So I kneel down, and I look under the van so I can see where he's approximately at. So I watch him come up to where he's almost in the front of the van, and I stood up. And as he's going by the van, I fired. I never knew the man, you know, what he looked like or what his job was. Then I found out the next day that he was uh, police. But had I been told to do him anyway, and I knew he was the police, I most likely would have done it anyway. I don't think I would have said no. Kuklinski had killed a cop, a cop who had gone bad, selling information to the Gambinos, a cop who was eliminated before he could turn state's witness. For Kuklinski, contracts like the Calabro murder were strictly business. They gave him the money he needed for his family. The Iceman was leading a double life. He lived on a quiet street in Bergen County, New Jersey, surrounded by neighbors who had no idea they were living next door to a mafia hitman. He was determined that no one, not even his own family, would ever find out who he really was. I never questioned him, and you just knew, don't do it, don't ask. Uh, if he got up at 2 o'clock in the morning or during dinner and put on his shoes and walked out the door, you said, bye. You didn't say, where are you going or why are you going? And it was just understood that that's the way it was. I was the happiest when I was with Barbara. Never involved in anything I ever did, never told her anything I did. If I did, I probably would have shocked the pants off her. I don't, she knew I had a violent temper, and I did have a violent temper. But I don't think she thought I would go as far as I did go. Richard's time with his family was sacred, and any interference would throw him into a rage. It made him even more angry if it happened during the holidays. This fella, I mean, he owed uh, me about $1,600. So here we come Christmas Eve. And I go there and he says, now nah, come with me, we'll go out, we'll have a good time, we'll party, we'll meet some broads with this, that, and the other thing. I said, no, I gotta, I would really like the money. I gotta buy something and, uh, you know, he gave me a, a story, a bull story. So I left there. I was uh, a little bit upset. Got on the bus, went home. I 
was uh, putting the toys together for the kids, and this thing was really bugging me. It was annoying me. It was just making my whole disposition bad. Thought just occurred to me, this is bullshit. It was Christmas Eve, after midnight, his family was sleeping. Kuklinski got in his car and drove to New York City. I went to the bar. They told me he just left and he was parked a couple blocks down in the parking lot. I believe the parking lot was closed, but he, he was parked in there. I saw his car, his car was running, but it had snow on it. So I knocked on the door and he says, hey, how are you? Glad to see you. Come on, sit down. So I go walk around the pasture side, sit down, I'm talking to him. I said, look, I really need the money. I says, you know, it's not right. You've, been, you've just been playing me like a fool here. I had this pistol in my hand and he just was annoying me to no end with this babbling. And he was just going on and on. And I fired. And I couldn't see a damn thing because there was snow on the windows. And when that flash went off, I just had spots before my eyes. My ears were ringing because the noise inside the car when the, the gun went off. I couldn't hear, couldn't see. Then I panicked because now I don't know what's going on. Anyway, I had caught the guy in the temple, and as he moved back, the second shot caught him in under the chin. Only about the time I could see, I reached in the man's pocket, and he had a roll of money. I took my $1,600 off him, put the rest of the money on him. That was his in his pocket. Got out of the car and walked away. And that's when it happened one Christmas Eve in New York City. The Iceman had killed by gun, by knife, by Molotov cocktail and cyanide. But he also liked to experiment. Crossbows, I just popped a guy in the forehead with it. Actually, it was just <laughs> seeing if it would work. What was he doing at the time? Looking at me. Well. Was he sitting down, or were you standing over him? Or? No, he actually bent down to look in the car window like I was asking him directions. I didn't know the man. Was this a contract murder, or was it something out of anger, or was it a personal thing? Neither. What, what was it? I just wanted to see if this thing would work. You mean you're experimenting on somebody? Right. Did it work? It sure did. It went halfway into his head. Kuklinski was always looking for new ways to get away with murder. In the 80s, a man who was nicknamed Mr. Softy teamed up with Kuklinski. This harmless looking ice cream vendor was in reality an army trained demolitions expert who was a violent and vicious killer. Mr. Softy was an individual by the name of Robert Prongay. He used to operate a Mr. Softy truck. That's why he got the name Mr. Softy. He became friendly with Kuklinski, very friendly with him. And 
it is our opinion that that uh, friendship led to uh, Richard Kukwinski learning a lot about uh, killing with different types of chemicals, including cyanide. He taught me a lot, basically. But he was extremely crazy. But he would read all kinds of books on destruction and all kinds of ways to, uh, to destroy somebody. He used to go around this Mr. Softy truck. That's how he used to spot people and get the outlay of the land, you know, where they were in easy ways. And sometimes he'd do it right from the truck. And he sold ice cream? Yes, he did. Sold Mr. Softy. He had one of those Mr. Softy right. trucks. Did and you ever see them? That's what he sold. And he sold ice cream to the little kids in the neighborhood? Yes, he did. And that's what he did. He sold. He'd go into these neighborhoods and sell ice cream to the kids and maybe kill one of their fathers. On August 9th, 1984, Mr. Softy was found dead hanging out of the driver's side seat in his Mr. Softy ice cream truck. He had been killed by multiple gunshot wounds to the head. I think Kukwinski killed him because he used him for his information, he used him for his knowledge. He probably brought him around brought him with him on certain jobs that he did and it was it was time for the boss to make the decision uh, that he didn't want any more loose ends he may have said something the wrong way to Richie who knows whatever it was Kukwinski in my opinion made the decision to kill him After Prongay's murder, Kukwinski was hired for a dangerous contract no one else would touch. It was here in a crowded discotheque that the cyanide killing techniques learned from Mr. Softy paid off. Couldn't get to this person, he was in a uh, disco. So I was really in a bad way because there was a time schedule involved and I happened to be watching these people and there was a couple of gay people dancing and whatever and nobody was paying them no mind whatsoever they were walking anywhere going anywhere because people basically don't look at gay people but the idea came to me yeah Try to act gay, but how in the hell am I going to get by? A 300 pound gay man. I mean, you know, that's a little bit far fetched. So I went to the extreme of far fetched. I got this loudest costume you'd ever want to see on. I mean, I went full blown gay person. Of course, maybe the other gay people are going to be pissed off at me, but. I'm not saying anything bad about them, but I got this canary yellow sweater and these bright pants, and uh, I got these elevated shoes, which I'm told to be good. Now I got these thin shoes on, and I acted like a full-blown gay person. I mean, and I got on this thing, and I'm doing this like dancing bit. And I get onto this thing, and they got these lights. And I hate those lights, by the way, those strobe lights. Man, I hate those lights. You can't see good with them lights. And it messes up my eyes. So anyway, I'm trying to get close to this guy. So I'm doing this crazy thing. I'm acting real swishy. I guess that's what you would call it. And I get up close to this guy. And I bump into him. But everybody's bumping in everybody. 
And he had a heart attack. Because they had hypothermia, you know. When I bumped into him, I, I popped him with the needle. What was in the needle? In his case, a heart attack. There was no doubt that Richard Kuklinski was a stone-cold killer, and most people thought that's why he was called the Iceman. But law enforcement had another reason for pinning this name on him. They called him the Iceman because to confuse the time of death, he would take his victims and put them in a freezer for long periods of time. One such victim was a man named Louis Masgay. He did too good a job on this body. After leaving the body in a freezer for over two years, he then took the body out and dumped it where it was found before it had thawed out. So when the medical examiner does the autopsy and opens the body up, he finds ice inside the body on a warm summer's day. The medical examiner says, there's something wrong here. This guy couldn't have died in the past few days. After the discovery of the half-frozen body of Louis Masgay, the noose began to tighten around Kuklinski and his boss, Roy DeMeo. Under pressure from law enforcement, DeMeo began to act erratically, and the family felt he was about to crack and testify against them. There was no question in their minds, he had to go. In 1983, DeMeo's body was found in a trunk of a car. He had been shot five times and had been dead a week. There were some who thought Kuklinski might be responsible. Do you know anything about his murder? Who, DeMeo? Yeah. He outlived his usefulness. And he was uh, running the wrong way. Apparently, everybody thought he was going to run to the law. What did you feel when uh, he was killed? What'd you feel about it? I was all broken up over it. I got a bridge for you, to, too, I want to sell you. What? Mm -hmm. I got a bridge for you, too. I want to sell you a bridge. I wasn't broken up over him. That was a, my attempt at levity. But I thought at the time it couldn't happen to a nicer person. If somebody had to die that day, it was a good day for him to die. Over the next three years, the New Jersey Organized Crime Task Force concentrated on closing in on Kuklinski. When Kuklinski began to feel cornered, he started eliminating anyone who could implicate him in his criminal activities. If he called you friend, you had a problem. Yesterday's friend soon became tomorrow's enemy. One of those friends turned enemy was a man who had been Kuklinski's partner. His name was George Malaband. Georgie boy. Yeah. Yeah. I liked him. Actually, yeah, really liked him. One of the few people I ever really liked. But Malaband had developed some bad habits. He racked up thousands of dollars in gambling debts to loan sharks. Kuklinski had vouched for him and told Malaband he'd better pay up. Then Malaband made a fatal mistake. He told Kuklinski that if he didn't back off, he would hurt his family. Which really struck a nerve with me. It, it, 
it upset me, but I was trying not to uh, get upset with it at that time. Because I figured he was just nervous, maybe, and he was just spouting off, but uh, apparently he wasn't. But the Iceman couldn't forget that Maliband had threatened his family, and several weeks later, he began to plan his murder. We got in the van, and uh, I said, George, we, you're really sincere with the fact that, that you had hurt my family and, uh, to get back at me. And he said, uh, that's the only way I could get you, I could get over on you, or get you to do what I wanted you to do, is to hurt your family. I said, but that's a stupid thing to say, George. I said, knowing how badly or how sincere I am about my family, I said, for you to say something like that, you must realize you're going to make me mad. He said, no, you won't be mad. He said, because you'd be afraid that something would happen to your family. I said, well, you're very wrong about that, George. I said, because I'm going to put a stop to that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put a stop to that right now. And I shot him five times. I could see them entering, because he was right here. We're sitting in the van. I'm in the driver's seat. Georgie boy was over here. In the next seat, which was, you know, just like that. And I went pop, pop, pop. And I went pop, pop. And I could see the material moving on in the, on his jacket as these things. Actually, they made little marks on it. They, on the jacket, I guess they were burn marks. So. Kuklinski's favorite way of disposing of bodies was putting them in barrels. But with a six foot, 300 pound George Maliband, it wasn't easy. So when I got him in, I had a problem with one leg. I had a hell of a problem with a leg, I'll tell you. No matter what I did, I couldn't get that leg in there. So I had to cut it. And put the top on. And I drove down to Jersey City where I dumped him. The next morning, a passerby noticed a dented steel drum turned over on its side. When he walked over to get a closer look, he saw a pair of legs, one of them bloody and hacked. The body was George Maliband. Police knew Kuklinski was the last person to see him alive. The New Jersey Organized Crime Task Force now had just one mission, to gather the evidence to arrest and convict Richard Kuklinski. The final method that was used was in fact the introduction of a uh, undercover federal agent, Dominic Polifron, uh, who was able to win Mr. Kuklinski's confidence and was able to record conversations where he detailed his participation in these murders. I portrayed myself as a hitman. I told him I worked for the uh, wise guys downtown New York, and my, my brother was a good fella downtown, and uh, I went by the name of Dominic Michael Provenzano. You know, I just have a few problems I want to dispose of. I have some rats I want to get rid of. Yeah. The only fucking thing I don't understand, don't you use a fucking piece of iron to get rid of these fucking people? You use this fucking uh, sign? Why be messy? You do it nice and calm. The tapes made by the undercover agent had nailed Richard Kuklinski, and his career as a contract killer was finally over. At his trial, his family learned for the first time that they really didn't know the Richard Kuklinski, who was also capable of being the deadly Iceman. Richard Kuklinski is now serving multiple life sentences in New Jersey State Maximum Security Prison. Ironically, his younger brother Joey is also serving a life sentence in the same prison. 
When Joey was 25, he was convicted of raping and murdering a 12-year-old girl. After he strangled the girl, he dragged her body over two adjoining rooftops and threw her and her pet dog to the street 40 feet below. Want to talk about your brother? Or? What do you want to talk about? There's nothing to talk about. Because we never brought up your brother in the first show. But and, we'll uh, talk about him, we'll talk about him. He's yeah. been here for 25, seven years, something like that. He's been here a long time, 25 years, I think. They don't hold me to that exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty close. And he's here for murder? Yes. What happened? How old was he when? Uh... He was a young man. He was in his 20s, I believe. And what wrong, went wrong in his case? Do you think he still uh, was a product also of you know, what you went through? We come from the same father. Do you see him, Richard? I pass him. What do you say? Just hello and keep on walking? How you doing, Joe? How are you? Take care. That's it? I told you I have dual short stories. That's, that's being over-friendly with my brother. Does he try to talk to you? He says less to me, as a matter of fact. Sometimes he doesn't even answer me, I don't think, thinking about it. That's too bad. Depends how you look at it. If by some uh, miracle, Richard, you got out of here tomorrow, let's say, mm. but let's, for the sake of argument, what would you do? Would you go back to that life or would you do something No, else? it's past me now. I have 10 years without violence. I don't really look forward to violence anymore. I don't even think I could play the game anymore. Probably get myself shot the first time out. I wouldn't do it anyway. I'd look to retire in a nice, quiet place someplace. No banging doors, no people yelling and screaming. Somewhere if I wanted to think, I could just sit there and think. Is there anything you wouldn't do, Richard, for uh, a contract murder? Yes. What wouldn't you do? I wouldn't kill the child. And most likely I wouldn't kill a woman. Did you ever let anyone go for whatever reason, did you ever decide to let someone go? Yes. But then I thought better of the idea and shot him anyway. Did you ever murder anyone you liked? All my friends did. At one point in time, I'm sure I liked them. But not at the moment of killing them. I might have even liked him then. Honor among thieves? There's no such thing. You see, because I was put in prison by a man I knew 30 years, and I liked him. Big mistake. I had one friend too many. I'm now serving multi-life sentences because of my one friend. And he's the only friend I didn't kill.
Hoffa? Yeah. I don't know anything about Hoffa, Jimmy Hoffa. Oh, the scuttlebutt, let's say, let's put it that way. Scuttlebutt, he's in a Japanese car. Supposedly he was picked up, put in a drum, put in the trunk of a car, put in a crusher with other cars, crushed, and shipped overseas. That's what I heard. Don't know. I think the last time I asked you that, you thought he was a uh, Toyota. Could be a Toyota. Some little Japanese car. Now, log on to HBO.com and find out more about this documentary and others in the award-winning America Undercover series. Informative, interactive, intriguing. America Undercover at HBO.com. In two previous HBO programs, Richard Kuklinski, known as the Iceman, who is serving multiple life sentences, answered many questions about his brutal, cold-blooded killings, solving many cases. But the unanswered question remains, why? I was a person who was able to hurt somebody at any given time with no remorse. And who could do it over and over again without it bothering them. Did you think of yourself as an assassin? Assassin? Sounds so exotic. <laughs> I was just a murderer. In July of 2002, HBO invited Dr. Park Dietz, a world-renowned psychiatrist and consultant to the FBI, to search for an answer to the mystery of the twisted criminal mind of Richard Kuklinski. With the Iceman's cooperation, Dr. Dietz spent 13 hours over four days talking with him to try to understand this human killing machine. If I understand you correctly, you're positive you killed more than 50 people. And Definitely. you think you probably killed more than 100 people. Definitely. You're sure of that one? Definitely. But not sure it's more than 200. I wouldn't say definitely to that. Maybe yes, maybe no. I would say less than 200 people. Well, you tell me. Uh, it's not less than 200 people. You killed more than 200 people. Sure. Yep. I killed, basically, more 100 people when I was a young man before I even knew anybody. Too much. In one part of my life, I killed people for nothing. Just for somebody to look at me wrong, I would kill them. Stab them, 
Shoot them. We tended to shoot people up close and personal. Definitely. I wanted to tell them just before they left. I wanted to say goodbye. Did you like to look them in the eye? I wanted them looking straight at me. This was a long way away. The distance we are now, we were closer. What did you want him to think as they died? Just see my pretty face. I take it to them. But the last thing they ever saw was me. And if they carry that glimpse to eternity, infinity, or whatever it is, they're gonna be thinking of me all that time. I'd be looking in their eyes. I would see the blankness come over it. I'd watch them die. I just didn't shoot them and walk away. I saw the surprise, the shock, the blank. They're gone. And all I saw was my reflection. But that's it. Did you have a favorite place you'd like to shoot? A favorite? Well, most of the time, if you're up close, you shoot them under the chin. You would shoot them. Shot a guy one time in his uh, Adam's apple. See how long it would take him to die. How long did it take? A few minutes. He drowned, actually. He didn't. Yeah. Drowned in his blood? Mm hmm. I was with somebody else. We had a $50 bet. I lost. You thought he'd go faster, huh? Yes. Do you know what an adrenaline rush feels like? Oh, yeah. What will give you one? Sex. It's the only one. I don't really get anything from hitting anybody, hurting anybody, shooting anybody. It does nothing for me. The only thing that gives me pleasure is sex. Well, that's a different kind of pleasure than what an adrenaline rush is. pleasure, I guess. Yeah. If I were to beat somebody up, it would do nothing for me. If I knocked him down and stepped over him, that's why, you see, it doesn't bother me. I don't care to hurt anybody. It does nothing for me, killing someone else. But you could never get a feeling out of it. I never got one, though. It was disappointing. That's when I figured I must be crazy. Because I figured some of them should have some kind of a feeling. Something. The Iceman sessions with Dr. Dietz reveal that even at the age of 10, Richard Kuklinski was already showing signs of pathological behavior. How were you with animals at that age? Deadly. Cats, dogs. Cats, dogs. I used to tie two cats' tails together. I drove over a clothesline and watched them rip each other apart. How long does it take? Not long. Did they both die? I don't know. I never stood around to see if the final thing. <clears throat> I would say uh, eventually they both died because they were both pretty well tore up. Got to be noisy. It was quite noisy. What else would you do with cats? Well, we had the incinerator in the project there. So I threw a cat in the incinerator. Then I threw a book of matches in there. And through the door, I watched the fire get bigger and bigger, and this cat was running around trying to get away. Eventually, the fire got too big for him, and he didn't run anymore. You only did one cat? No. 
That yeah. was a pastime. Did they all behave the same way? Mostly. Uh, one almost got out the door. He almost jumped back up, came out the door, I threw him in. Because that's where I was looking, and he almost came back out. How about dogs? I've kicked them off the roof. Tied them to the back of a bus. Then they'd just be dragged once they got tired. Never saw the end of those things, so just did it. Do you remember any feelings associated with it? I don't think so. I got a, maybe a little excitement. Most of the time, though, after that, I felt disgust that I did it. Because I didn't really do anything that took any kind of a challenge. I just did it on some kind of helpless nothing. They couldn't stand up to me anyway. And you'd be alone when you did this? Yes. Did you say you were bored? Mm-hmm. Is that mostly what it was about, fighting the boredom? Probably. When there's, you, you had nothing to do, so look for some, break the monotony. Richard's father, Stanley, was the adult who had the most impact on his childhood. It was from him that Kuklinski learned how effective violence could be. What's the worst beating you ever took from your old man? <laughs> I don't think there's much difference in any of them. They were all pretty bad. He uh, left his mark on me, pretty much. And he did most of that before you were, what, 11? Yes, I was young. And was that worse when he was drinking? With Stanley, it didn't really matter whether he was drinking or he wasn't drinking. He was a nasty son of a bitch, and he always will be until the day he died. And even when he died, he was a nasty son of a gun. Did you go to his funeral? No, I didn't. Was there one? Yes. I didn't like him in life. Why would I want to go see him in death? I was glad he was dead. How about your mom? How was she? Over the years, I got to dislike my mother a great deal. But now that I have more time to think about it, she was just a victim of her own life. As a kid, how did you see her? Hateful. Disliked her a great deal. She didn't believe in uh, sparing a rod either. I mean, she used to hit me with a uh, broomstick if I did something wrong. Where would she hit you? Wherever it hit. As Kuklinski grew older, he swore that no one would ever again treat him with disrespect. He held unreasonable grudges and would sometimes stalk his victims for days. How much would somebody have to humiliate you before you'd become obsessed with killing them? It, it, would, it would be the degree he, he humiliated me. If it were not my, and it would be the time. It would be how my attitude was. If I was jumpy or edgy, it wouldn't take much. If I was passive, then uh, he, he might get away with it. But no one really knew. I took a guy down one time, just following him around. He was with a few people. Now, as they went to the bar, this person decided he couldn't wait to get inside to urinate. He never did. Everybody else went in. He stayed outside to urinate. He urinated. Uh, he went comfortably anyway. He had an empty bladder. But I actually strangled him. 
from behind, I assume. Definitely. I actually did it in a way that's maybe, maybe this is original. And maybe not, I don't know. But I uh, put the rope around his neck, twisted it, <clears throat> and threw him over my shoulder and held him there. So actually, he, I was the tree hanging him. Yeah. And he eventually just stopped kicking. And I let it loose at one end. He slid down to the ground. I put him over by the garbage and uh, left. Had you brought a length of rope with you? No, actually, I. <laughs> it, um, this guy, um, these people had a, um, uh, around the back at a bar, they must have lived upstairs. There was a pot upstairs, and they had one of these things where they had a rope across this thing, and they had a couple of these lines going across this way. And that's what I took. Talking about clothesline? Yeah. Now, what had this guy done to you? I didn't like him. He just made me mad some some reason or other. For me to track him and wait for him, I was mad at him for something. Do you remember what his body did while you were hanging him? Yeah, I was twitching and kicking. How long did it take? I don't really know. Didn't look at my watch, so I really couldn't say. You know, I kept him a while. Even after he stopped, I kept him a while just to make sure. Did you have another weapon with you? Yes. But this was quieter. It was more personal. I actually felt him die. Did you like that? Didn't do anything. But I, I mean, I did feel him die. I felt him go limp. And you got your relief? Yes. Basically, I didn't have any more pressure, no more tension. It was, it was almost like a cure-all. <laughs> Unbelievable. Kuklinski's early years were plagued with a hair-trigger temper. If he had a problem, he solved it the only way he knew how. I was driving in Georgia one time, and we were riding down the road, and there was a couple of vans running around, and they were hooping and hollering there. I guess they were having a good old time and maybe drinking and whatnot. They decided, I guess it was interesting to play with a guy from New Jersey, and they started to click clack and with their vans and push me here and push me there off the road, and they were running in and out. And what their problem was, I really don't know. Never did know. But uh, it came to a point where um, I got extremely mad about that, and. Uh, but it was silly of me because I was away from home. I had no backing, I had no problem. I only had one weapon, which was in the trunk, which was a 357 with a hair trigger. So I stopped the car and got out, opened the trunk. I had the release and went in the trunk and took the 357 and just stood there. Now, apparently their eyesight mustn't be too good because I don't think I'd walk up on a guy with a 357 standing by his side. But these fellas did. Foolish mistake. They all died. And I didn't even know them. How many? There was a few of them. I reloaded. Killed every last one of them. Yeah. And that wasn't even one I wanted to do. Do you think that what they did was a capital offense? What they did? You mean playing with me? Yeah. Well, they could have killed me. Well, they ran me off the road and I died. 
Bad behavior, no argument. Reckless endangerment. Reckless driving, host of bad things. Is it a capital offense they committed against you? Apparently. I did kill him. So to me, it must have been. Because when I had come to that point, and that point, that is the last point they come to. I don't back off once I go forward. Once I go forward and I take a gun, I do not back off. I didn't know how many they had. I didn't know what they had. They could have had guns. They could have had anything. They wanted to play with me. I didn't want to play. So we didn't play no more. And I would have taken whatever came. You almost made me mad. I know. What made you mad about that? I don't know, but you almost did. Can you figure out what it is? No. Try to look at it. Look at what made you mad there. I don't know. I think it must have been something you said. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, but I don't know what it was. Could it be that I was challenging you and it sounded judgmental? Could be. Hmm. Yeah, it could be. Because you've got me annoyed with you now. Yeah. That's the truth. How mad are you? I bet. Pretty. I feel a little flushed. So that means that I've reached a point in my life that I'm a little annoyed. What would you like to do? Doesn't matter. I don't think it's gone to the point that I'm actually gonna do anything stupid. Just uh, curious to myself why it, why it happened. I don't know why it happened. I'm, I'm actually almost glad it did happen because you had a chance to see something. But I don't know why, it's, why it happened. Did you feel I was criticizing you? Yes. Is that what did it? I think so. I think who, that's the part that did it. Who used to criticize you the most? Of course, my father. Yeah. In his 20s, Kuklinski's proficiency at remorseless killing caught the attention of the mafia, and he graduated from the impulse murders of his youth to his new career as a contract killer. He tells Dr. Dietz about his first murder for hire. He gave me a picture of him and um, a description of what he does and what he generally does and where he goes, places he goes. And uh, so I went to the area where they said he might be, and uh, I saw somebody who looked like him, similar to him. He had a knack for smoking, and they told me he smoked big cigars, Churchill cigars or something. So I uh, pulled up alongside of him. At the time, I was riding a motorcycle. And I just said, uh, Cuban, are they Cuban? Looks like a good cigar. And he wasn't a happy camper, because he said, fuck you. <laughs> and I, when he said, fuck you, he looked my way, and I got a clear shot of his face. It was a picture I had of the man they wanted. And uh, I said, nah, don't fuck me, fuck you. And I just took this weapon out and blew his head off. It just disintegrated his, uh, like you see a pumpkin get hit with a shotgun or something, they just poof, spread out. And that's what happened. And I, light turned green about the time I shot him and I left. Have you any response in your guts to see a man's head explode? It surprised me a lot. A response in my gut. What kind of response do we want? 
I don't know. I don't have any response. Most people, when they see horrible things, if they see somebody badly injured, certainly see something that awful, have a visceral reaction. They feel nauseated. They may want to vomit. Mm. It makes them very uncomfortable all over real fast. Mm. Did you get anything? No, it's a good thing I didn't have to vomit because then I would have had real problems on that motorcycle. But I didn't have that problem. I didn't have any sickness, dizziness, or upset stomach or anything like that. It helped you adapt and cope not to care. Definitely. Not to care is much better. Because it's a weakness to care. That's right, it is. Then you have baggage. When you care, you can't just move. You have to worry. And you got something to lose. That's right. By the late 60s, the Iceman had become one of the mob's most efficient contract killers. His most brutal murders took place at the Gemini Lounge in Brooklyn, a favorite hangout for the Mafia. Dismembering bodies, did that turn your stomach? I don't think so. I remember having pizza one day while we were doing something like that. Pizza in one hand, chainsaw in the other? No. <clears throat> I didn't like chainsaws. That's another fable that they've come up with, that I use chainsaws. See, chainsaws are messy. Yep. All you get is little, all over me I have these little pieces of meat. Now that's a pain in the neck if I use chainsaws. Now would I want to ruin a good shirt with a chainsaw? That would be downright stupid. And I definitely have the wrong. I don't think I could walk around with bits of meat hanging off me or bits and pieces of somebody's body hanging off me. I would probably smell a little bit bad also at that point. So what's a better way to dismember Just a body? knife. A butcher knife, you know, you cut it around the bone and a little slice here, a little slice there. and Wrap it, ship it. Do you understand that most people can't imagine doing that to a human? Sure. I can understand that a great deal. I can't understand why I can. Did you have to cultivate that ability, or is that natural for you? I don't know. I don't recall. I did it. I don't recall when I started doing it or why or the feeling I had when I did that, I don't know. Jeffrey Dahmer told me that when he cut bodies apart, yeah. it repelled him. He found it horrible. He had to get himself drunk to overcome that Stink. natural revulsion. Yeah. It's because it's disgusting. Yes, it is. But to you, you could just do it. No feeling. No. The smell sometimes was uh, annoying, but I would put cologne on. I would generally put cologne across here so I could smell the cologne a lot better than I could smell anything else. Canoe or something like that was always nice. Now you're dating yourself with that. <laughs> but it was still nice. What else would you use for the smell? Spray, you know, any deodorizers, you know, spray, put it in the air try to kill the smell. But the uh, deodorizers actually were worse than the smell because when they mingled, somehow or other, they gave off a more, dit more distasteful smell. So what I would take is a bottle of canoe and just throw it all over the walls and the floor and everything. And I'd have a $25 nice smell in the room. It was an expensive deodorant, but it worked. Guns, knives, 
strangulation, even cyanide were all part of Richard Kuklinski's repertoire of murder. He even froze some of his victims' bodies to confuse their time of death, earning him the name of Iceman. In his sessions with Dr. Dietz, he reveals that some of his clients wanted his victims to suffer before they died, and Kuklinski obliged by offering them a nightmarish death of sheer torture, a death he often captured on film. I used to have a thing where I would take somebody into a cabin or cave, whatever you want to call it, and I would uh, <laughs> I would tie them up or tape them, their hands and their um, feet together, and um, then I would leave them there, and I'd leave a camera on, and. Um, Rats used to eat them. Rats used to kill these people. It was a very painful death for these people because uh, rats would uh, eventually smell them or come near them and and uh, start nibbling away at them. The people would definitely scream and yell and holler and try to get away. And uh, eventually more rats would come and they would uh, consume these people eventually, you know. But there was a lot of screaming and yelling in between. But when I did that and I watched it on, the devil was that. Super 8, I think it was. Uh, I found it uh, distasteful and it used to make me nervous for some reason. I said that was some type of uh, a feeling which I wasn't too keen on having. But I did it because it gave me a feeling of some kind, and therefore I was trying to find out what it was that was giving me some type of feeling. Whether it was the, the horror of what was going on, or the screaming that was happening, or just the nastiness of it. But I never figured it out. But I did that quite a few times, too maybe too many times. And watched it? Yes. I beat a guy at that one time. I had blood in my shoes, his blood in my shoes. It just goes on that way. I had to throw all my clothes away. You know, I was driving a big Lincoln Town car with butt naked. <laughs> Has she wrapped around me? <laughs> We're having too much fun, you know. You realize that? I'm coming across like a nice guy. Nobody's gonna believe this. Nobody. I wouldn't believe this if I was watching this. Because I'm the furthest thing from a nice guy. I am what you call a person's nightmare because of the way I project myself, people think they can get by. And then all of a sudden, when they wake up, it's too late. They already hit the stop sign. And that's a dead stop. But there have been people you've been good to, aren't there? Not many. There have been people. I don't know what you consider good. I, your interpretation of good might be different than mine. I don't know. What do you mean good? 
Well, how do you think you were with your kids? Oh, the kids. Now you're talking completely different. Now you're talking black and white. There was nothing I wouldn't do for my, my children, nothing. I'd kill everybody in this room for them. That's just to show you a point. Not that I would or want to, I'm just saying I would. If it meant I had to for them, I would do it without even thinking twice. It might upset me, it might hurt me, but I would do it. Does that answer your question? To a point, but then you're not sure. All right. Who else were you good with? Good with? There aren't many people I was good with. It was only my family. I would, was good to my family. And even those people I hurt. How? Just by being there. I was a nasty son of a gun. I am a nasty son of a gun. What, what would happen at home? You name it. Violence, I think they call it domestic violence. Yes, I've caught it at all. There's nothing I haven't done and nothing she hasn't put up with. I'm not proud of it, that's the way it is. I could say I'm sorry, what good would it do? I couldn't have been too sorry, I did it again. But yet I was sorry. I couldn't control it. It's one of those things. I couldn't control I found something I couldn't control. Almost a hate, love, hate, love, relationship. So I really liked, loved the girl. But when I got mad, I forgot all that. And wound up hurting the person I loved. So where did I really love her? I still hurt her. I got to trust her more than I trusted anybody in my whole life. She's the only person I ever really trusted. He reveals to Dr. Dietz how far he would go to prove his faith in his wife, even in the midst of a violent quarrel. I believe I attempted her to do it. I, I gave her a knife and told her here. Here's a chance you'll never get again, or something like that. And I turned around. Now she had a chance. She didn't do anything. She dropped it on the floor and uh, walked away. And I left the house. There was a stabbing between your parents, wasn't there? Yes, there was. What room was that in? I don't remember. What happened? I don't remember. I don't know. Stanley uh, stabbed uh, Anna, which why I don't recall. I don't remember what it was all about, but I remember it did happen. Yeah. Stabbed her in the back. My. Uh, yeah. And here you are inviting Barbara to do that to you. Stupid, wasn't it? Yeah, but I did. Yeah, it's true. Were you testing her? We were trying to, uh, I don't know, it might have been. I mean, it would have been a powerful thing if, she, <laughs> if I was wrong. <laughs> yeah. I definitely would have got the point. <laughs> Told you you had a sense of humor. I know you did. That's why I treated it, didn't I? But it's not a joking matter. It's a very serious thing. Domestic violence is very serious. It's, I believe that's probably why uh, my daughter dislikes me a great deal. Probably because she lived through a lot. You know, she didn't live through it all. Heard it, saw it. Saw it. Everything. It's Psychologically, I just probably hurt them in some way because they have that in their mind as I have things in my mind. Why did you decide to talk to me? 
Well, basically, I think I tried it. I decided to talk to you was, would be so I could find out more about myself, since I don't know the answers. Uh, and you are a person who is highly qualified to give me answers, possibly, of what's going on. I really figured this would be a good time to talk to somebody like you, or you, you know. Well, why don't we turn the tables here and you interview me? I'll answer your questions. Interesting. I can live with that. Just so happens I might have a question for you. Hmm. <laughs> what do you think about me? Anything good, bad, or indifferent? Yeah, some of each. <laughs> the, um, the issues about your behavior, I think there are really a couple things to say. The things that I'm most sure of, based on the information you've told me, are that your principal problem has been a warp in your personality. And we classify personality according to different types. And there are two types of personality features that you have a great deal of. The first of them is called antisocial personality disorder. What it refers to behaviorally is someone who does not have a conscience, does not have remorse, does not feel a sense of guilt about most of the bad things they do, is impulsive and violent. Uh, the typical things we see before age 15 in people who earn that label are cruelty toward animals, cruelty toward people, and an awfully interesting part of that condition is that uh, we've got a little bit of knowledge of what causes it and where it comes from. And that's where there's some good news and some bad news. The bad news is that part of where that comes from is hereditary. That there's a genetic basis to being a fearless person. And You've told me about how rarely you have any experience that even begins to resemble nervousness or fear. It takes extreme things to make you have a sense of impending danger. Normal people get fearful about a wide variety of things frequently and would be uh, beside themselves with the kinds of experiences that you had on a weekly basis. You couldn't have done the things you did if you were capable of ordinary fear. But the fact that you're born with a genetic predisposition to fearlessness doesn't mean that it's inevitable for you to become a criminal. Because some people who have that genetic predisposition to fearlessness become pro-social risk takers. They do things like uh, drive race cars, uh, test fly planes, fighter pilots, bomb disposal technicians. Now, those are all jobs where it helps to have a lot of fearlessness. And in fact, some people in law enforcement are brave and have that same capacity to be fearless. And the difference between the people who grow up to be risk-taking good guys with white hats and the people who grow up to be risk-taking bad guys with a long, long rap sheet and a lot of crimes has to do with how their parents raise them. If you raise a kid with love and kindness and affection most of the time, you've got a good shot at their growing up to be 
decent, caring, loving human beings and treating their own kids well. But if you raise a kid the way Stanley raised you, with no love, no affection, constant abuse, beatings for no reason, all you teach is hatred. You make it impossible for that child to grow up and form strong attachments and loving, caring relationships or to be willing to risk themselves to protect the world. So I think you got to be this kind of antisocial, psychopathic person, both by getting Stanley's genes and having Stanley's parenting and your mother's cold, standoffish way of treating you. In other words, that part of you was both born and made. But your own kids and your own grandchildren will turn out according to how you and Barbara raised them, despite whatever genetic influence there may be. The other thing that I think is true about you is another personality style where I think it's fair to say that you've got the features of what we call a paranoid personality disorder. The general rule for someone who is paranoid is to trust no one, let no one get too close to you, and to never forgive anyone who does you wrong. If somebody criticizes them, they're quick to respond with anger or to counterattack. If somebody humiliates them, then they must have revenge. About one to two percent of the population has the paranoid personality disorder. About two to three percent of males and one percent of females have the antisocial personality disorder. And then there's a smaller group that has both. And it was having both that allows you to have this career that you've had and that allowed you to profit from your capacity for a completely emotionless, fearless, remorseless hit by being free of any conscience and also free of friends and of people who could bring you down, you were able to have a very long run as a successful contract killer, which is quite unusual. And you wouldn't have been able to do that had you not had both of those personality flaws in your line of work that turned out to be major advantages, kind of preconditions for a successful career. I appreciate uh, you taking the time and explaining this to me. I am probably the loneliest person in the world because I have nothing I care for. And I can't make any friends to have any kind of a relationship or... So I've lost everything. I've lost everything I ever cared for, everything I ever wanted. It's down the toilet. Since there is no love in my life, I must have something to replace it, so I replace it with hate. Constant hate. Constantly reminded to hate. And what's that do for you? Keeps my left foot going in front of my right foot. Keeps me moving. Without it, I would probably just plop down someplace and have no reason to continue. Is that all you've got left is hate? That's all I've got left. Everything that I ever cared for is gone. Everything I ever liked is gone. Everything I, that meant anything to me is gone. So hate. That's how you started with, too. Then I've come full circle. It's time for me to die. <laughs>